A modern software application is split into multiple components. You've got things like web APIs, services, background tasks, message queues, databases, that sort of thing. Now, some of these components you can control and others you can't. And if your application needs to call out to a third party API, for example, well, you can't control the reliability of that API. And even if the SLA of theirs like guarantees four nines of uptime or something really good like that, it doesn't mean it still can't go down. The circuit breaker pattern is an architectural pattern to help guard downstream components of your system against problems that you can't control. In this video, we're going to look at the circuit breaker pattern. We're going to look at what it does, what it protects from and when it's used and how you might implement it with some example code. So stick around. So the term circuit breaker comes from electrical circuits. You see, when an electrical circuit has an energy source and a load, you get a current flowing around the circuit. And that current is the same at all points along the path of the wire. So in this example, we've got a main supply coming into let's say our house, and that's a source of electrical energy. And that's um, connected to say a toaster. And the toaster might be drawing five amps of electricity, which can be measured at any point around this circuit. Now, while that toaster is running and drawing five amps of electrical current from the power supply, everything is fine. The toaster works, the power supply isn't being overloaded. But if something goes wrong, if say the toaster gets damaged and a short circuit develops, then suddenly the current that it draws will shoot up. It could go from five amps to 20 amps or 30 amps. And that's bad because in electrical circuits, more current equals more heat and 30 amps of current going through a wire that was only designed to carry say 16 amps can heat up and it can heat up to the point where it can start a fire. A lot of house fires are started by electrical circuits getting too hot. So the way we solve this in your house is we use circuit breakers. A circuit breaker is a device that consists of a switch and a way to monitor the current flowing through the circuit. So you place a switch in line anywhere around your circuit, let's say here, and it begins monitoring the current going through it. If the current gets too high, let's say you have a 10 amp circuit breaker, then if the current goes above 10 amps, then the switch will open and it will cut the circuit, which um, protects anything else in the circuit from being fried. So that's how a circuit breaker works in your home. It monitors the current going through an electrical wire and it opens a switch when the current gets too high. And this isn't a bad analogy, for how the circuit breaker pattern works in software design. You see, the only difference is that you don't measure electrical current, but you measure some other kind of performance metric of a component. So let's take a look at how this might be implemented in an application. Here we have a web service that makes a request to a third party API. So maybe uh, this is the back end for some kind of travel application and it wants to get the weather in a particular city. So our third party API might be a weather API and that's run by another company, another party. So when somebody using our app wants to know the weather, our front end makes an HTTP request to our web service and that will start a new thread on wherever this is running and it will execute some code that we've written. And that code will make this external API call to the weather API. It will wait for the API call to return, maybe do some stuff with the result and then return the HTTP response back to our front end. It then crucially frees up that thread that we started at the start of this process. Now this loop is like our electrical circuit, right? So hopefully you can see the analogy. What happens if the weather API starts to have a problem just like our toaster did? Well, there's two kinds of unpredictable problems that you'll face when you are making calls to external APIs like this. There's fast failures and then there's slow responses and timeouts. Of these two, fast failures are obviously a lot easier to deal with. If we make this API call to the weather API and it fails immediately and returns an error code, well, we can put a try catch around this code and we can handle that failure and we can report something back to our front end. It's not ideal because it means that the users won't be able to see the weather, but it does at least mean that our front end can handle that error, maybe display a little message to the user and then carry on serving other parts of our application. Crucially, because all of this happens quickly, it means that our web service can return quickly and then free up those resources that it was using to handle this HTTP request. 
So that's fast failures, but what about the other kind of problem? What if instead of failing quickly, that third party weather API just hangs? You call it and it just doesn't respond and eventually you get a timeout. Well, that can actually be quite a big problem because you see, if lots of users are making HTTP requests to your server and each one of these is calling that third party API, well, what will start to happen is they'll begin to back up. Each one of these threads was allocated, ends up just waiting for the third party API call to return. And eventually you'll run out of resources on your server and it will crash, potentially bringing down any other code that you might have running on that resource. So if there was an entire API all being hosted on one virtual machine or Kubernetes pod or something, well, this one slow weather API could potentially bring down your entire server. And that's what we mean when we mentioned downstream services at the start. It could be that after getting the weather from our web service, the front end wants to then go off and make another call to some unrelated data or something. Well, if the weather API has brought down all our entire service, then any future calls to it will fail as well. So we've gone from a situation where the user just can't see the weather to one where the user can't use our app at all, which is much, much worse. So what do we do? Well, we build a circuit breaker into this API call. You see, the loop here of HTTP calls, this is like the electrical circuit that we visited earlier. So to implement the circuit breaker pattern, we add in some code that monitors how long that third party API takes to respond. And if it detects that the things are getting quite slow, then it can trip a switch. In this case, that switch could just be a little bit of code in our web service that checks for maybe some flag in a database or in a cache. And if the flag says the circuit breaker has been tripped, well, it doesn't even make that call in the first place. It just returns an error immediately. So it just does a fast fail. This means that that stream of HTTP requests that are coming from our users are just getting batted straight back away with an error saying, error, weather data unavailable, sorry, continue with things or something like that. Our server's resources are getting freed up and the downstream services, that's the pieces of code that also uses resources, well, they're protected from all of this noise by our circuit breaker. So we've avoided that failure cascading into other parts of our application. Let's take a look at a code example of this being implemented. Here we have a web API controller that serves those HTTP requests coming in. Now this is in C sharp, but you could write this code in any web framework that uses this MVC pattern with controllers. Um, so here we've got some using statements, which aren't particularly interesting. Uh, and then we've got um, where we're declaring our controller. Um, this is a controller for providing weather data. So we've called it weather data forecast controller. Um, and then we've got a couple of dependencies that are injected into our controller. When a new instance of the controller is created, we get these two services. Here we have an API client for our third party weather API service uh, and a caching service that lets us talk to our memory cache. This could be Redis or something similar, depending on how you set up your .NET server. So let's zoom in on the action on this controller because this is where we've implemented the circuit breaker pattern logic. The first thing you can see here is that when the request comes into our API, we go straight off to the cache and we look for that flag, that flag like is weather API down. And this is just a Boolean that we've stored under a key in our memory cache. And this Boolean flag is the trip state of the circuit breaker essentially. So we have an if statement here that says, if the weather API is down, i.e. our circuit breaker has been tripped, then just return immediately with an error. So this is that open state that we saw earlier on. When the circuit breaker is open, just return um, immediately with an error. So back in our code, if this flag is not true, then we go off and we make the API call. Now, this is the line of code that we're trying to protect. This is the weather API client service here, and this will make an HTTP request off to that third party API. And it's possible that that request hangs and times out. So we've wrapped this call here in a timer object so we can measure how long this third party API call takes. And then when it's returned, whether it passed or failed, we examine the time elapsed in milliseconds from our timer. And if the API took longer than some predetermined time to return, what we can do here is increment a counter. Now the counter in this case is just stored in another field in our memory cache. In this case, it's just an integer that we can increment each time the API is slow. The logic here is what trips our circuit breaker. It says, if the API was slow to respond for more than X number of times, then set the weather API is down flag to true. And if you remember from the start of the function, if that flag is true, then we return immediately with an error. 
Lastly, we return the result from the API because obviously we still want to give the user back the data. So that's how a circuit breaker gets tripped, but what about resetting it? Well, if you've ever tripped a circuit breaker in your house, you'll know that you need to go down into the basement or under the stairs or wherever, and then you actually have to manually flick it back into place. Well, with the circuit breaker pattern in code, we can be a bit smarter about that. The pattern gives us a third state called the half open state. So as well as our switch being closed and our switch being open, it can be in this half open state. And what that means is that even though the circuit breaker has been tripped, every now and then it will actually make a request out to that third party API. So we could say that, for example, every 50th request that's allowed through and it makes the call to the weather API. Uh, and what this does is it gives us a chance to reevaluate the trip conditions of the circuit breaker. So if we make this occasional call to the weather API and it does indeed still time out, well, that's fine. The circuit breaker stays open and we wait for another 50 requests. But if that test request succeeds and the weather API is back up, well, then we have the option of resetting our circuit breaker if we want. We can put it back into the closed state and we can allow each request to call off back to the API again successfully. So that's the circuit breaker pattern and how it works. I will just add that the implementation we showed you here in code, this has just been some logic and a controller action, but there are lots of different ways that you can implement the circuit breaker pattern in your architecture. For example, if you have a serverless architecture or microservices, then you might want to put this uh, API call into its own cloud function or microservice, and then have a circuit breaker logic deployed separately, monitoring this code from afar. You might also have a separate scheduled job that probes that third party API and sets a circuit breaker flag based on what it does. You could use a cloud function or something to do that, but the logic is still the same. You measure how long it takes to call this resource and you trip the circuit breaker if we detect that it's gonna start slowing down our services. So I hope this has been useful. As always, if there's any questions you have about this pattern or any of the other things I've spoken about, um, or if there's anything I haven't explained, then please put them in the comments below. Don't forget to check out my other videos and have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah.